Are you still on the fence about creating your own podcast? Listen, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. It's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your very own podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will also distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so many more. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Speak Your Truth Podcast. It's about being real. It's, it's about sharing real stories. It's, 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 it's about sharing our truth. These, 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 these are the stories of the people, people, people of the city of Milwaukee and beyond. This, this is Speak Your Truth Podcast. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Happy hump day. We're hope, we hope that you're all staying warm because it seems like this polar vortex is really um, taking a toll on the entire country. So um, praying for the people in Texas. At first, it was kind of funny, but then like hearing that people have are without power, without food, without some shelter too, like it is kind of turning into a horrible situation. So um, hope you're staying warm. This episode this week is um, on a more serious note and is very important. And we like to visit mental health um, at least one at one to two episodes per season. So today we are talking about mental health for men. We have a special guest here. And before I let him introduce himself, introduce himself, I just want to do a mental check with my boys. How y'all doing? What's going on? I'm good. I'm good. And you definitely right. We, we we definitely be having all different type of subjects on here. You know, we be doing a little ratchet sometimes, but we definitely need to get serious sometimes too, as far as our subject matter. And this is definitely one of the ones we need to touch on more often times than not. How you doing today? Just overall. Oh yeah, I'm I'm good today. I'm definitely I'm valid. You know, you know, I always be better, but this this sure. motherfucking this motherfucking winter time be having people down and like Oof. like you don't really want to do shit like you know what I'm saying unless you got to like. Wintertime, we have you in the crib chilling, watching Netflix or some shit like that. Can't wait till the summertime. Okay. Back. Yeah, winter depression definitely is <laughs> real. <laughs> Hibernation mode, like yeah, a mother. And this cold ever. Man, I swear to God, I was. I ain't joke about Dallas. None of that. I was like, nah. that shit was sick this past weekend. I was in Minnesota at the Mall of America. And I'm talking about freezing up there. Uh, I couldn't believe that shit. Oh, what well, about yeah. you? Now, I'm. I'm um, I'm getting in depressed mode now because you know when you talk serious, you bring all your problems to the conversation. So I'm about to be that dude. I could have came in excited, but I'm just gonna just be um, a little down. I feel like I gotta change my voice because today is a day that uh, we, you know, we all gonna get something off our our mind or it'll answer a question that someone need to know. So um, yeah, I'm just a little emotionally happy. So I, I would say, like, for me, my mental health this week, it's kind of been up and down, um, you know, coming off of the high of Valentine's Day. So I did have a really Ooh, good Valentine's Day. That's why. I, <laughs> look, they just dropped this phone. He said, <laughs> shit. That's how they are. Shit. I did, I did have a really good Valentine's Day, like, memorable Valentine's Day. And then when you kind of come back into – work and then everyday stress and then virtual learning has been somewhat of a struggle for um my son and then so all of that stress and then being a small business owner I'm everything right the HR person I hired a social media intern shout out to Aaliyah but then I have to do everything else create marketing do inventory do the sales um package orders so there it's just been a lot of stress on me and I literally um yesterday wanted to quit like wanted to give up and it, it just felt too much. And I'm like, I don't think I'm I'm doing this right. And and um, I'm growing. And literally yesterday and today, um, two of my customers reached out to me and they said, man, yo, your marketing has been on point. And 
another customer came and picked up an order and she said, man, I could really tell that your heart is in this and God is going to continue to bless you and what you do. I feel it. And I'm like, dang, I, I, I really needed that. Like I, I needed that. You know, how, like if you're spiritual, they say like God speaks through people to speak to you. So I really felt like I needed that. And then the customer today, shout out to Rika. She was like, yeah, your marketing has been on point and keep doing what you do. I'm so proud of you. So that, that made me, I'm like, okay, like I, I I'm doing something right. So your, your mental health got checked. That's good. You got My little... mental health did get checked. Um, I did do some other things this week. You know, I had some some self care therapy. Like I took a nice long bath, put some um Epsom salt in there, did some meditation, prayer. You know, I have you know herbal therapy too. I indulge in that <laughs> to keep me calm. Um, but I it, it was a rough week in the beginning, but now I'm kind of getting over that hump, and I'm super excited. Um. So important today. So we have a very special guest here with us. And and we're talking about mental health for men. Of course, mental health is encompassing for everyone. But specifically, we want to focus on men today and, you know, different strategies for coping and grieving and what is considered mental health for men. So we're going to start and um, let our guest introduce himself. And we're going to dive right in. So hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Corbett Jan Oliver. Yep, speak to the mic. There you go. Sorry about that. No, you uh, could. My name is Corbin Tannhauser. Um, I'm uh, 33 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, reside in the north side of Milwaukee. Well, now I'm in West Dallas, but born and raised on the north side of Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. So I've been here. Uh, high school graduate from Milwaukee, Vincent. Okay, V House. So, yeah, we all know our class of six. Um, what a north. recovering. <laughs> oh, there. Okay. And I'm a recovering addict. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been recovering now. I've been in recovery for four years. Okay, congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Um, good. And my addiction is uh, payments. Mm-hmm. Uh, going a little, giving you a little background history. Mm-hmm. It started at a younger age, but I didn't realize that till therapy. But mm-hmm. just from the base of where I thought it started from mm-hmm. in 2011, mm-hmm. I ended up having a hematoma behind my shoulder blade mm-hmm. that was full of infectious fluid that found it uh, toward the muscle underneath my arm and it created a mass and a sinus tract in which it came to a head and started pouring out pretty much. Wow. And they went in emergency surgeries to within 48 hours, got to get it cleaned out. And then from 2011 to 2016, I've had 10 more surgeries on the same shoulder. So in between all of that, the rehab and just Mm -hmm. the physical pain of it, continuously going into it, we're going to give you medication. Right, right. Okay, we're going to start off with medication. Now, medication don't work. We're going to be a little more. We're going to try something different. Mm -hmm. All right, before I know it, I'm in too deep, and I don't realize it. I'm probably second, third surgery into it, and I'm hearing people talk, but nobody's talking to me. Mm. I'm listening to everybody speak about me, but not Mm -hmm. speak directly to me. So going forward over these years of all of this, the only time I realize I'm an addict is when I'm running out of medicine. Mm. And now the withdrawal setting in and the, oh, I got to get off this. I got to get clean. But when I got it, I'm good. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I would buy it and purchase it from the streets. But my main supply was the doctor. Mm -hmm. I could go in and get what I want because I was in pain and truly in pain and had a track record of being in pain. So right. it wasn't as I was manipulating, because at first it wasn't manipulation. At first it was in dire need of let's stop this pain. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden it was, oh, no, oh, yo, you're addicted to it. Your body mm-hmm. physically needs mm-hmm. it and craves it. Mm-hmm. And then it got scary. Mm. So if uh, if you don't mind me asking, what, which painkillers did they prescribe? I was on everything. I was on okay. Percocet and Percocet. Yeah. Morphine, and it was all a, always a combination of multiple together. Yeah. So it was never just one thing. Yeah. So finally, in February 9th, or it was February 7th, mm-hmm. 8th, I'm sorry, 8th, leading up to that week, I worked at a bakery. I worked mm-hmm. at Brad Smith over in Silver Spring. Oh, yeah. Bay Movie That's the spot. I worked there for five years. I mean, I loved it. But going home, working a third shift job, I had time alone. Right. And I would always do the wraparound by the parkway. And as 
I was going north towards Lisbon. Yeah. There's that turn there. Yeah. And for days leading up to February, I mean to February 8th, there was three days. Every day I drove home, I wanted to go on that wall. Mm. And we're talking seconds away from not turning right mm -hmm. and going straight in. And then that night, my ex-wife at the time called me. My daughter's four. Mm -hmm. She calls me. She says, Corbin, Sydney just woke up screaming. Mm. I said, well, what do you mean she woke up screaming? She okay? No, she just woke up screaming from a nightmare saying you're not coming home and mm -hmm. that your daddy and her daddy's not coming back. I'm like, oh, she's fine. Put her to sleep. Let her know daddy will be home in the morning. And then it clicked. The last three nights, you weren't coming home in the morning. Mm. She really, at that point, it was like, okay, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Got my friend who worked at the uh, bakery with me that I'd known since he was a kid. Right. And at the time, his woman was going through the same problem I was going through. So we were having the conversations. Mm -hmm. I was a functioning addict. Okay. You know, so I was working every day, doing everything I need to do, still taking care of the bills, but at the same time, draining the accounts. Mm. So I could work all day long. Mm -hmm. But then when it was time to make sure that I was taken care of so I didn't stop functioning because of my addiction, mm -hmm. you drain all the accounts, now we don't pay the bills. Mm. Mm. Okay. So it, that's why, you know, personal relationships got torn because of it all. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to stick around and deal with the abuse of an addict. Yeah. And a lot of times the addict doesn't know. And by the time they realize it, it's too late. You've driven a wedge between yourself and mm -hmm. yeah. your other. That's true. That, you know, it's hard to come back from. And, you know, and ultimately with our personal stuff, didn't work out. But yeah. Um, at that point, I called my ex and told her, I need you to find me somewhere to go. I got to get clean. And it's. In her mind, she thought, ah, oh, he's just saying this again. He must have ran out of pills. Right, right. That's always what you revert back to when yep. you're running out is I got to get clean. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, I knew I needed to. So she called around, made some calls, and she found a place here in Milwaukee, which it was like a detox center. I don't even know the name. Genesis. It might have been. Or, yeah, either that or Gateway. Right. And we're on our way there. And I tell her to pull over. So mm -hmm. she's instantly scared. Oh, my God. He doesn't want to do it. He's going to go find something, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I need you to find me somewhere where I can go, not just get through the detox, but they can teach me how to give me a base of how to stay clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we pulled over. We went to George Webb's. She made some phone calls to the hotlines. Well, now it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. you got to go through all the insurance process. Yeah. Everything's closing. So I'm in the midst of a 24-hour detox, you know, my first 24 hours, and we can't get a hold of nobody. they got to get a hold of me in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there that night struggling to not go and call somebody to get something because mm. it was as easy as a phone call. At that yeah. Time. And we made it through the morning and they got back to us and they said, okay, we're going to put you on a plane. We're going to fly you to Florida. I'm like, all right, cool. It's February. I'm, I'll be happy to go to Florida. And then they changed it up an hour later and said, no, you're going to Illinois, mm. you know, drive down through the snowstorm. And it was a blizzard driving down there three and a half hours into Gilman, Illinois. Mm. And they sent me to a recovery center that, it was a 30 to 90 day pro treatment program, um, you know, the severity of your addiction. And I ended up graduating my 30 day program in 28 days. Good. So, I mean, it was when I got there, they asked you the basic questions. What are you doing? What are you addicted to? Yada, yada, yada. And I told them the amounts of everything that I was taking. And they looked at me and they were like, well, you were stupid mm. because you might as well just been shooting up heroin for the amount of money you were spending on prescription meds. Mm hmm that's how many prescription meds I was taking. And I didn't even realize it because. So, so then, and, and not to interject, but were, was insurance covering, like when you would go to like Walgreens, was insurance covering or did they make you like pay out of pocket? For the prescriptions? Or? Yeah, for the prescriptions. Um, I had, a, I, I, we had, we had uh, insurance through my wife's job and she, okay. or my ex-wife's job. Yeah. And she worked at the hospital. So we had decent insurance. Yeah. You know, so it was a $7 prescription. But oh, wow. I could go sell that script for $2,000 on mm -hmm. the street. Really? Exactly. So, I mean, we weren't talking, you know, small amounts. We were talking high scripts because of the amount of pain that I was in and all of the surgeries that I had. Yeah. It got to, it got to the point where it was so easy to manipulate the doctors. Wow. You yeah. know, because... You, you, My, you had a history. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I had a track record. And by the time the doctors realized what was going on, it was too late. You know, it got to the point where they couldn't even stop the monster from that. So then, so my, so just coming from a family, so my family, um, 
so it has just really been played with like substance abuse and addiction. So my mother um, has just all her life has been kind of like battling with substance abuse. Now I learned a lot about, so eventually, you know, after prolonged use of, you know, whatever drug that you may be addicted to the drug, um, some people say that it kind of takes over and it's in control and it's not you. Do you kind of agree with that Absolutely. sentiment? You do? Absolutely. Me, I mean, me and Drew, were, uh, we had a talk yesterday mm -hmm. and, I live every day pretty much caging the monster that I put away that day. I mean, it just because I walked away out of a program didn't mean that once I, I was safe for those 28 days. I didn't have to worry about the rest of the world. It was a three day walk mm -hmm. back to Milwaukee and nobody was coming to get me. You walked back to Milwaukee? No, 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 no. Oh, he's saying okay. that he wanted to leave. Oh, gosh, gotcha, you got gotcha. you. Okay. I to leave that facility. I was going to have to hike my ass back here because nobody was going to drive to come and pick me up. Early. Yeah. Not until I had that token, that graduation form, everything that said he passed this. He's ready to go home. He's ready for the real world. Nobody was coming, you know, and it wasn't the fact that it was bad for me. Like they, I needed to be there, yeah. you know, in that first week was miserable. I mean, mm. I tossed a room because I couldn't find a wallet sized picture of my daughter. Mm. But at the same time, I couldn't talk to her. I couldn't mm. see her. You know, I, you got to go through that detox. Search. Yeah. And the more they let you talk to your family, the more you want to be with your family. Mm -hmm. mm. And, you know, I was a father from the day she was born until today. I mean, I, I never had a day off, you know, so now going and saying, okay, I'm going to go pretty much abandon my child for 30 days. Yeah, that's You tough. know what I mean? And I, in the midst of trying to become normal again. Yeah. You know, and it, the hard thing for me to grasp of what was normal. You see, and I'm so glad you brought that up. So another thing that I wanted to ask you is because, so I'm an adult now and you know, I, I had, a, and she was addicted to drugs when I was a kid too, but now that I'm older, I kind of understand. So then I never could understand how she would relapse after she got clean. And then the therapist was telling us like, even if your life is going normal, the easiest thing can can trigger you again to want to relapse. Do you agree with Absolutely. that too? I mean, can you explain just a little bit more about what that means? Okay, so I have my I, I you have your good days, you have your bad days. Yeah. Okay, and every human being has theirs. Yeah. But being an addict, you know, suffering from PTSD, depression, anxiety. Yeah. I'm dealing with a monster inside of my head on a daily basis, and when I came home, I had to be rewired and have to learn how to rewire my brain mm -hmm. on what I thought was normal, you know, because your normal isn't my normal. Right. And you will really never understand what my normal is in the speak of words. You, you wouldn't be able to comprehend it because mm -hmm. I couldn't find the words to explain it. To mm -hmm. you. So now coming home and trying to say, okay, how do you go for, to, from stopping something that you did every day, even just being in the house with your child, cooking, cleaning, driving down certain streets, I couldn't do for the longest time because mm. that was the road traveled to go get what I needed. Mm. So coming home, it was, you gave me the tools, you guys gave me the programs, the NAs, the AAs and everything. And those are great base programs, but they're not meant for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I learned that going into it and there's, Nothing wrong with it. And I have a lot of friends that are in those programs and it works for them. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to work for everybody because we're not all the same. That's true. You know, I grew up dyslexic. My brain works a million miles a second and I can't keep up with my hand writing it on paper. Mm -hmm. I know the thought I want to get down, but I just can't get it down. So same thing going to my addiction. How can I say that you can learn math the same way I can learn math, but I can't learn math the same way you. So now going into my addiction is, how am I going to do it the same way they're doing? That's it? true. It yeah. It doesn't work for me. It's That's not true. normal for me. So I got to figure out a new normal for me. So when I came home, it was, I had to eliminate everybody that I was in contact with when it came to my addiction. Mm -hmm. If if you gave me a pill, I couldn't talk to you. Mm -hmm. If you were in that realm of that, I couldn't be around you. Right. And I sent out a message when I got home to all of my friends explaining this, mm -hmm. saying, listen, it's not you, it's me. It was like a breakup for me. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. and I told him, it's not a permanent thing, but I need my distance. I need to be able to find myself. And still to this day, there's people I can't be around. Mm -hmm. I love them to death. If they call me, I'll come. But it better be for a good reason. Right, right. You know, because there's certain things that people do and even and say, and they want to change and everything. But 
for me personally, I can't be around. I can't put my family's risk at doing that. You know, yeah. I didn't meet my daughter sober for the first four years of her life. Mm. You know, and I have to live with that regret for the rest of my life mm -hmm. until she becomes of age where I can sit down and explain to her what happened for those first four years. Mm -hmm. So then that way she's aware and she can not she can learn from what happened instead of trying to keep it a secret if it's affecting her. Yeah. You know, but I'm not going to put that on her at eight. You yeah. Know, I'm going to wait until she's an adult or, you know, an older yeah. teen where she can comprehend because I'm not going to leave, leave her out there blind thinking there's nothing wrong with her dad because he's a superhero. Mm -hmm. No, your dad's messed up. He's just learning how to deal with it every mm -hmm. day, mm -hmm. you know, so. So then, so th this this is good. So, and it's kind of a great segue into the next portion. So, um, so I do understand that you dealt with a loss, some loss too, oh, and yeah. grieving. Um, so why don't you share a little bit about that? And just as a man, some of the things that you did to kind of help you through that, like get you through that loss, just like dealing with it as a man. So most recent loss was my son back. Uh, here in March, pretty much at the start of COVID, so March 9th, um, we lost our son at 21 weeks. He mm -hmm. was alive for three and a half hours. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't just a, oh, she had a miscarriage. Like, he was living, breathing, but he was only a pound and a half. Mm -hmm. You know, and to watch him struggle, I, I came to terms that day I couldn't control anything. You know, you have this, this illusion that you can control some things in life can't control anything. When you're sitting there staring at a woman cry her eyes out because she can't stop a kid from coming and he shouldn't be here yet, it takes a it takes a hit on you, yeah. you know? And we were at the hospital where I had all the surgeries. So now I'm dealing with PTSD. So I'm trying mm. to be there for my wife. Yeah. But I'm scared shitless because I'm in the place where all of my stuff was going. Yeah. So to try to figure out how to be there my mother was scared for me because she automatically thought as soon as we lost our son, I was going right back down that road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And for me, I had to find the strength within myself to show, to be there for, to be a rock for my daughter, to be a rock for my wife because they were going through it. Mm -hmm. You know? And if I couldn't stand up and be there for them while they were going through it, who else was? You know? And that's where I found strength in you know, trying to get through it more. But I linked on everybody I knew. Mm -hmm. You know, I had friends that they'll never know how much they actually meant to me and got me through everything. Yeah. You know, because we don't talk on a daily basis. You know, we're friends on Facebook and through sports activities. But would reach out and say, hey, I went through this. I did that. You know, I gone. I went through everything that you're going through, mm -hmm. you know, and he went through everything I went through and he was able to help me at times that he would just randomly check in and say, Hey, how are you and the wife doing? How are the babies? Cause we ended up having twins here in December, you know, Congratulations. so we ended up having our rainbow babies yeah. right after. So they, they're preemies. They finally made it home. So they're two months as of Yay. yesterday. So, but he was able to check in and he knew, mm -hmm. you know, but I never would have, Phantom that yeah yeah because we was talking about that. and I want to touch in real quick on that because a part of that what we talked about is to help people that's watching and uh, uh help a lot of guys all the guys understand that just because you don't look like the person that can help somebody to them that you are who they need because this person that we're talking about because you know we goofy play a lot yeah. you know uh our, our friend Jay Davis and Jay Davis is somebody you know he, he plays a lot but he's a very serious man when he when he's serious and he got kids of his own, he Absolutely. got twins. So it's like, but him to be that person, you, he don't realize what he do now, how big of a factor he was by just reaching out, mm. not even knowing that they barely talked. Yeah, we It's like, they just see each other, but barely talking. Then you feel like you can offer this man something. And, and you did. So I, I just want to give a shout out to you and let everybody else know, like, it's okay to, you know, take that chance, a, a leap of faith, and just reach out to somebody. Don't just look at somebody go through something and then right. knowing you went through it, especially if you, you know, you you made it through. Well, you 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 know what that. So now we and we can definitely transition because um, Alexis, uh, she's a therapist, couldn't be here this evening, but I do have some tips. Um, I did reach out to some other therapists and get some tips for men. But I just want to ask y'all, as men in the room, um, when it comes to like 
mental health, I think that a lot of people are under the impression, like if somebody going through it, it's like, oh, let me kind of fall back so yeah. they can go through it. Yeah, but what, what's your take on that? For me personally, that's the wrong thing to do. Yeah, me personally, when I went to recovery and I was going through the therapist sessions with everyone, you have your family, mm -hmm. you know, therapy sessions and you have your personal therapy sessions and they get down deep. And the first week, all my addiction stemmed in 2011 when I had my first surgery. By week three, mm -hmm. I was addicted to stuff back when I was in middle school, elementary school mm -hmm. that she brought out of me. Mm -hmm. And talking to my family members, they told me that they seen my pill addiction, you know, downward spiraling years before I even noticed it. Wow. And I asked them, well, why didn't you say anything? Well, we didn't want to make mm. it worse. Mm. Okay. We didn't want to offend you. We didn't want you to shut us out. Yeah. We wanted to be able to keep our distance and keep an eye on you mm -hmm. instead of, you know, bringing it out. But by then it was too late. So almost enabling you almost, but didn't know. Exactly. Okay. And not even trying to do it. Just trying to not add fuel to the fire. Yeah. You know, and like even now, so my twins came home, you know, mm -hmm. and in the month of them being home, we barely sleep, you know. Right. I work all day. I barely sleep at night. So it's it's times where we forget to eat. I mean, my wife's snapback is amazing. Period. Right <laughs> for me, being a guy that struggles to stay above 155 pounds, for me to lose any weight, it looks like I'm relapsing. Mm. So my mom brings it to my attention the other week. She says, hey, is this something you need to talk to me about? I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm near. What are you, what's going on? She was like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. My kids is here. Everything's good. She was like, is everything else okay? I'm like, mom, what are you talking about? She was like, have you been taking pills? I'm like, if my if my kids are my addiction, then I'm fully addicted okay. to them because they're the only reason that I'm not eating, I'm not sleeping, everything else. I said, I'm never going to put these kids through it again, but I appreciate the fact that mm -hmm. you actually asked this time. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not offended by it because I'd rather you ask me if you see something, mm -hmm. ask me about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where I wish I would have would have gotten it yeah, back then. but I mean, and I probably you wouldn't have listened. Though. That's what I was just gonna say. You probably wouldn't have been ready. So I know for some some men, it's like when you try to, they're not mature yet. So you you are very mature and very wise. And it's like when you try to bring somebody's attention to something, it's like, well, why are you asking me and this and that? So like, what about y'all? Like, if y'all like, let's say like y'all guys is like going through something, are you the type to kind of reach out or like just kind of like fall back when it comes to? Just checking out, like, your friends, your brothers, your, they, they're mental. Like, how, think about the relationship, like, with your brothers, your dad, your whoever. I mean, I'm definitely I'm definitely one of the friends that's always trying to look out for my friends. Or, you know, as far as just, like, on, if I can't do nothing else, uh, we could at least talk or, you know, discuss about things. So I'm definitely one of the more reaching out friends. You know, people I really consider friends or people I be around that I uh, – have personal relationships and know personal stuff about it and will actually be knowing they was actually going through stuff. So I, I'm definitely one of the friends that I, I talk it out with my friends and we always have good conversations and try to be as honest with each other as we possibly can because no matter how close you are to a person, you can't never walk a day in their shoes. You know what I'm saying? So y'all might come meet each other for lunch or somewhere, you know, something like that. But once they leave lunch, they got to go continue walking in their shoes. It's like you got to continue walking in yours. So, you never really can know what somebody really going through. You only know what they what they what they uh, let you in on, or you know what I'm saying, what you actually see for your own, which are for yourself. But you're not with somebody all the time, so right. you can't really 100 percent say what somebody's really going through. What about you? How do you kind of keep up relationships with your male friends? Like just check on their mental health. Uh, to be honest, I, I definitely got better on that within the the years from uh, watching other podcasts and watching a lot of shows and movies and stuff that kind of helped me see why everybody goes to therapists on movies and stuff. So I started paying attention. And then I realized I'm not good at reaching out to people because I can't accept that they deny it. So I feel like if I know you're going through something and you won't let me help you, I'm going to look at you differently, not judging. It's like, I know you're going through it. You're not letting me help you. Mm -hmm. So I, I gain that and stop reaching out to help people because I feel like I lose them as a friend. So even my pops went through some one time and I seen it. It was clear. Everybody, you know, some, not everybody, but some people had their jokes and oh, he'd be all right. You know, but I'm looking like, no, it's something wrong. He ain't never dressed like that. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, when I go to approach, it's like, 
it's ready to fight or it's like mm-hmm. you know it'd be the other stuff because like I, I didn't know and that broke me down so i'm like if i can't even do it my own father i can and, he, and it's like i wouldn't beat yourself up i just kind of think that maybe your father wasn't in the position to kind of like yeah but I, now what i learned now what i'll say yeah. now i feel like i will i got to see the you got you know how we get vibe like mm-hmm. I, I need some help we'll wink and we're in danger like i feel like people that do that with me they understand my my, my body language when it comes to something like if i'm Acting like I ain't got no drinking problem, but be every time he looking at me like, "You sure you good? You sure you good?" I'm, a, I'm one of them. Sure you good is gonna let me know like he trying to help. Mm-hmm. But some people ignore them on purpose. Mm-hmm. So like, if somebody can catch that when I say, "Hey, Corbin, hey, you hey, sure you good?" Right. And be, hey, I'm good. And I say, "All right, all right you sure know. you good?" And then he like, all right. So at least that's me telling him, "I ain't trying to embarrass you, but if you right. deny me, I'm not gonna push forward. I'm not gonna, you know, I want you for the tax." I can I get what you're saying about that. About that, by that, Drew, because you know some people always want to play the victim role. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So when you try to even help them out, if they don't even feel like they got a problem or something going on, it's not really working in their favor. If they don't even realize that first, they uh, more times than not they're going to feel attacked or they're going to yeah. play victim or you know what I'm saying. People or they depends the on what their addiction is and they flip on you. Exactly. And then now y'all friendship mess up because they was. Yeah. So like, then they don't know. Like these people, days, people don't want to admit. People definitely lash out because they they don't see the underlying problems of, you know, whatever your addiction may be. It might not just be drugs or it could be alcohol. It could be anything. You know what I'm saying? It's, if you watch my 600 pound life, they addiction are drugs. They addicted to food. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So people on hoarders, like every yep. everybody. You know what I'm yeah, saying? No matter what, true. no matter what your addiction is, like when you go to that extent. Where it's to the point where it's it can be, it can you be and other people around. Shopping, mm-hmm. exactly. shopping, shopping, yeah. All that, I've like, seen that. No matter, you know what I'm saying? No matter, no matter yeah. what it is. I've seen exactly. people addicted to sex. Exactly. Their gambling, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Drinking. Don't say gambling. Don't say gambling. I'm just saying, but it's the truth, though. You know oh, this thing, too, about, about addiction. People think addiction is something that you do every day. Right. If the addic- addiction is something that, that, that affects you, yeah. and then you repeat it, so... What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, okay, uh, just because you might be addicted to liquor, but you don't drink liquor every day. If you get drunk every Saturday and you fuck up the family party, that's the alcoholic. You addicted to yeah. being yeah. drunk. And li- you might not. I don't drink every day, but oh, you, you don't need help on how to handle it. Binge drink alcohol. Yeah, because ah. they might drink two days and then they worse than somebody that drink every day. Drink all day long. Yeah. 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 Actually, yeah. those are more dangerous alcohols. And that's what the driving and the because you don't all the shit coming from. You know what I mean? Taking on so much alcohol can be wasted every week. That's an addiction. That's not fun. You go to whole. You go to whole week. Shit face, you know yeah, you gotta carry the same person up every Friday. Like, all right, now you don't know how to drink to have fun by now, right? <laughs> like, you're addicted, but let's get you checked out. So, uh, some of the therapists I reached out to um, share some strategies to help men, you know, grieve, cope with loss, and just in general take care of your mental because we know that um, there's a lot more when it comes to a man because, like, men unfortunately aren't taught to be in tune with their emotions like women. If a little boy falls, it's like, oh, you know, yeah, but then yeah, if a little poor so girl falls, it's like, oh, okay, let me hold her. It's like, <laughs> boys need to some extent, boys definitely need you know, nurturing too. Because as men, you're not most men aren't in tune with their emotions, just like that's why you see a lot of men calling. Russell Russell Wilson the simp and it's like no this man love his woman but we ain't gonna get into that but one of the strategies um for men and let me know if you agree or not is journaling have any of you tried writing down your thoughts drawing coloring just any kind of like writing as an outlet um me me personally I probably I'm gonna say music more Okay, music. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna say like listening to music. You know what I'm saying? That's probably one of my one of my better outlets. But I just you know thinking to yourself, you know, but definitely music. Okay. What about you? Have you ever I tried say, journaling? Yeah, I definitely. I tried it, and I will say, I do believe it worked, but I don't do it as much as I should. But I did realize not too long ago that it's a book I wrote. Some I was just writing and writing and writing, and I'm like, it helped me that day. So I'm like, I know it worked, but I do need to do it more. I will say that. For me, uh, music was my main thing back in rehab. Mm -hmm. When my son passed away, music's always been my turn too for everything. When I'm having a bad day, I get lost. I can get lost in the same song all day long. Me too. And it'll never get boring. Um, But when my son passed away, I decided to to help me start grieving and to help me start coping, Mm -hmm. I was going to write a letter to him. 
Mm. And writing that letter to him, and I read it at his funeral, mm -hmm. you know, writing that letter to him made me vulnerable enough to help me start yeah. my grief, you know, mm -hmm. and it helped me start trying to get my life back together to normal. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, everything was shut down. COVID, the day of the funeral, they shut down the city. Mm -hmm. And the funeral home called us and said, we don't care what they're saying. Y'all gonna have the funeral, right? And they kept it open for us, and we got our funeral in, and then they shut it down. Um, and thank God they did that, cause I yeah. can't imagine, Oof. you know, not getting any closure from that. Yeah. You know, and, and for the longest time, you know, we were locked oh, down, damn. you know, at that time. So now, with that happening, you know, I got thrown in the house. So I wrote that letter, and there's days now where it will get so bad, and my wife's gone, my daughter's at her mom's house, and I'm at home alone. I'll pull out that notebook where I wrote that letter and I'll start writing down notes and things that and things that happen throughout the year because when his birthday comes here and comes up in a month, I'm gonna write him another letter. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm even though he's not with me, he's always gonna be with me. So it's always gonna be my update to him of my year and how everything went, you know, and that's just gonna help me cope with everything. So then, so one of the, another one of the strategies is, um, so you, you touched on letters. So one of the, a strategy from journaling is the therapist said, writing letters to yourself, forgiving yourself. Um, have any of you ever tried that? Like writing a letter to yourself or to your kids or no? No, I mean, never. I, I probably, I, I probably do that to myself. I, say I wouldn't do it, but I, I have, I've ever done yeah. it. Yeah, funny. One of my guys on here, according to Lisa, freestyle around used to be uh, having bad days, and, and that, I, I forgot they used, they used to help too. You yeah. can write about your own problem. I can't pay the bills on time. Right. Um, <laughs> another strategy is yoga. Um, and it's not even like, even if you can't get into the poses, but like sitting down, centering yourself and listening to music, have you, would you consider doing yoga to try to de-stress or just yeah, meditation? I mean, that's, yeah, that's damn near, I mean, right up there, we're working out because, you know, yes. when, you, when you, when you working out more times than not, you got the music going. So, you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. that, that damn near go hand to hand. That's like the sanctuary in his own self, if you, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You kind of think, man, you know. And then another question that came in is, why do you think um, men find it so hard to recognize that they need to go to therapy? Mm, that's, I mean, because we don't see enough people. I mean, because you got to surrender and like yeah. basically, you know, you gotta, I need it. We you got to think about it. Like, I, like you said, though, no matter no matter what race you are, if you coming up as a dude, more times than not, you coming up as a male. I should say, you coming up as don't cry. You got to be tough. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You got to be, you know what I'm saying? So you, you really learn, you really show that you need to mask a lot of the way you feel it or don't let things affect you as much as they probably are or don't, you shouldn't show it. What they say, never let them see you sweat basically. Right. You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's probably why it's probably, I ain't going to say look down on, but it's probably why a lot of people don't speak right. up on needing, needing help. If you think about it too, though, it just started becoming a normal thing for everybody. Yeah. Now, yeah. mental health is being spoken about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, yeah. But, now, like, now that, but, but the yeah. past generation, though, that's... Yeah, when nobody like, doing yoga and writing books. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's been passed on that you shouldn't need mental health. Yeah. Like, 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 who daddy was doing yoga? Like, like back then. People, like, uh, rich people. See? That's what I'm saying. They ain't let us... We did that. We just smack it. Get your, get your ass out the air. It's like, we can't... We couldn't even relax like that. You had to have a punching bag or... Play um, cans or something, so. Another strategy is ha having an accountability person. So do you have someone, like, if you are having a rough day? Because some people are just adamant. It's like, I don't got nobody. I stay to myself. But I'm like, no, we, we all are human. We need to connect with someone. Do you all have an accountability partner or someone that you um, that can hold you accountable? It's like, man, you need to get your right yourself together. Get yourself right. Like, do you all have one of those people in your life? Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like I got multiple people that are like, so for sure, for sure, moms, you know what I'm saying? She, she, she'll tell you, like, she'll tell me all the time, like, hey, you need to woo, you know what I'm saying? Make this better, you know what I'm saying? Get on that. Or, you know, and just, and just the people I be around that actually know me personally. Mm -hmm. They know your people that be around you, they know when you are feel square or something not going right mm -hmm. with you. Just like, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be vice versa. I'm going to holler at them when I feel like, oh, you ain't doing something or, you know what I'm saying? I feel like you might be going through something. I'm going to just come see, check on you, make sure you good. You never know. Shit, come smoke a blunt with you. Go get something to eat. You know, just chop it up. 
about you? What about you, Drew? Oh, I grew up, well, it was all boys in the house, and then we always had our cousins uh, and uh, the uncles and everybody over, so we had no choice but to be tough. So we got so used to hearing our problems every day by arguing. It's like, so to hold, hold each other accountable was easy. It's just dealing with it. It's like listening to the person after that. So I'm around a lot of people that hold me accountable, especially about, you know, allowing them to know something. They'll definitely tell me the truth if I was wrong or what I need to do. And... Yeah, I mean that's so. I, I always had. I'm blessed. I was blessed. To always had that, and um, it is important to have. But I know I see people that don't have it. That's why a lot of friends I got, I don't really see them having that away from me. Mm-hmm. So I think it's good to have young or really speak up on. Otherwise, it'd be hard to get. It's a blessing to have that. Yeah. What about you? Um, my family, my my wife and children, they're my anchor to life. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have friends that. When I got when I got out of the out of rehab, I had to change my circle. So I ended up becoming part of a motorcycle club. And my president, I shattered my hand and mm. I had to have reconstructive surgery. But the night I shattered it, I could I had nobody to go to the hospital with. Mm-hmm. So I called him. He's in bed sleep with his wife and got out of bed because I told him, I need you. If I go to the hospital now and they gave me pain meds. It's going down. Mm-hmm. And he got out of bed and he beat me to the hospital with mm. me speeding to the hospital mm-hmm. to make sure that when they offered it, he was there to make sure, no, he's good. He's in recovery. We can't give it to him. Mm-hmm. And he can take Tylenol. And he saved me that day mm-hmm. by stopping me because I knew where I was at because of the situation in which my hand was yeah. shattered. Yeah. You know, it was me physically, but the backstory behind it all, you know, he was the only person that could be there for me that night, you know, and still to this day, he's random. He's the most random person in the world because he'll call me. I got, well, we got a tracker on you now. Right. I got a rear end the other day on, on the what? freeway and he drove past me like, you good? I got to turn <laughs> I ain't spoke to him in a few, in a, well, in a few months. That's you're a real friend. We got a tracker on that car. Like, now nah, I'm going to make sure you are all right. That's, that's, that's scary and that's cool, funny. though. Um, so then before, so we, we can kind of wind down, um, and then we'll get into, to the talk your shit segment, but I definitely, um, you know, want to just circle back to some more tips. If you, um, want to get more tips on learning about men's mental health, you can definitely, um, Google a lot of research. You can connect with, um, a local black male therapist, Hilton Morris of Morris Awakenings. He's amazing. Um, accepts private pay and all type of insurance. If you are contemplating suicide, the national prevention, suicide prevention hotline is also available. I'm not sure if you've ever used it before. I've used it before actually twice. Um, so if you feel like you are going to dive, off the ledge, they definitely have uh, trained counselors to talk you back onto the ledge and help you. And then they even um, follow up with you. So any anything that's related to mental and anxiety, I know a lot of people are living with anxiety. I am one of those people. Um, it's just tough. It, it sometimes it, it and it's not nothing new because like I was just saying the other day, having a conversation like, man, more and more high school kids. It seems like kids are getting anxiety younger and younger, and it's always been there. We've all had anxiety, mm-hmm. anxiety about fitting in and getting our homework. What we gonna wear to the prom? Am I gonna get shot for my shoes? But it's like you said, it's becoming more prevalent. Um, so we are going to turn shift gears to the talk your shit segment, and um, so I'll start. I think I'm going to go on a serious note. So we go around, we clap. I count, it's like one, two, three, and then it's like talk yo shit, and then each person go. So that's how we do it. My hand itching. Uh oh. Can you get some money? Well, it's a quarter down there. Y'all ready? Ooh, where? No, that's why it itches money. Dang. I was going to put that quarter in my savings. Look, my little vacation bucket. Little thing. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, talk yo shit. Uh, so I'm going to talk your shit today is, um, mental health is important y'all. And it's not nothing to play with. I mean, I know so many people who look fine on the outside and they struggle with mental, mental health every day. And I'm one of those people where it's like, I'm anxious and it's like, I, I haven't had anxiety literally until I became a parent. My life just seemed so fine, but now I'm worried about everything, his education and his well-being, his growth, and then trying to run a business. So taking on a lot of stress as a parent, as a single parent, as a head of household, that's already a lot. So I can definitely say to my fellow mompreneurs out there is if you 
um, are one of those people who don't have help, try to take some of your power back as much as you can. So um, when the kids go to sleep, try to journal. And I know you're dead exhausted, but try to journal, try to listen to some music. I, I'm never not going at night without taking a bath. Like I, <laughs> I have to take a bath. And I really like, if that's your only time, like me between orders and everything, I'm getting in the tub and I have my candles, my Epsom salt. I have my, my caddy, my little board that's going across there. And I journal in the tub. Like that is my time. My child is asleep. I don't have to worry about him getting up. So I would definitely say if you have no one that you can talk to, no other alternative, like something that you can do yourself is definitely taking a, a goddess diva bath and you just feel amazing when you get out. Get, get out of it. Put some strawberries, like eat some strawberries when you're in there too. Like I have whole meals in the bathroom. But anyway, <laughs> but um, take care of self, especially men. Um, I, I, I really, you know, it's unfortunate that a lot of our men just aren't really in tune with their emotions and it's not their fault. Um, but I definitely would like to see more men kind of mature and come into their own and really just live to their fullest potential because you're hindering yourself being stuck down, you know, and I ain't going to therapy and now that that's weak and feeling that I ain't finna cry. And it's like, nah, that ain't, that's not a flex. So I'm done. Who's going next? Go. All right, B B. All right, one, two, three. Talk, talk your talk. shit. Yeah, you know, just keeping it on the same note. Like, definitely, mental health is definitely important because everybody, like we said, we you never know what nobody going through personally on their own time and their own day. What uh, what might be affecting them and had them, like you said, anxious, stressed out. You know what I'm saying? Financial stress, everyday stress, emotional okay. stress. All that type of stress, like, so it's definitely good to check on the people that you around and the people that you love, mm -hmm. you know, just sometimes and see see how they doing. You know what I'm saying? Because you never know, and that's from your kids all the way up to the the people that's older than you and the people and your peers that's around your age too. Just try to check in on people sometimes and make sure they good. That's all I pretty much got to say. All right, you ready? One, two, three. Talk your oh, shit. I got two things. My first one is quick. It's random as shit. I just went to visit my mama real quick, and she just she was coming in the house when I was getting there, and she just passed me the blunt. Yeah. Randomly. I don't even know when she smoked, what she was smoking for, but she had a good mood, and I just hit the motherfucker. So it's, it's different ways to relate <laughs> to your family, and, uh, you know, I ain't seen her. So she happy, I'm happy, and I don't even smoke. She just passed it to me. So she's a great, good, bad mom, because, uh, that just felt good because I, I say that to say that it, it, you, you can't say where you're going to get the love from or how they show love. And that my mama was showing me she was in a good mood in the past blunt. No damn why yeah. I probably wasn't going to take it, but I took it. So that was a mom-son uh, moment. Period, mama. Right. Yeah. So she hires a, she hires a bitch right now. But Your mama? She ain't addicted because she don't smoke like that. So, But we I was talking to um, Corbin. This is my next uh, part. We are talking to shit yesterday. It was, um, man, I want to say thank you, you know, for myself to for you to invite me over. And uh, to talk to you about this situation and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is that I already, everybody probably already know, like from kickball world, our personality was always standing out. Like, man, them two dudes never really get mad. They always, they, they positive. Everybody want to play with them and all that stuff. So it was like, I knew it, but I just couldn't put my finger on it because I don't, I don't speak as much. And right. you don't speak as much. Like, we got to just run into each other. Right. So for us to actually connect now when all, and then after the season in the summer, you came to me, we had a talk. It's like, you talking about my character. It had nothing to do with kickball. So I say, hey, man, I'm glad you did what you did. And I'm glad you're still here. And I'm mm -hmm. glad you're stronger. And I, I met your, your your twins and your daughter. Man, that's a blessing. Like, if people, like like you said, you got a whole new circle. Right. So I feel blessed that I can be a part of this circle that you got now. That's and dope. the trust is real because he had a big-ass dog. Ah! It wasn't in a cage or nothing, just sitting there, no, no nothing. Oh, and he said, God. Drew, trust me, he's good. And I and I sat there and it like that let me know like he always gonna be real because he know like I would have ran out, but he like Drew, I'm he's Dude, good. Was it he gonna move, he gonna move off there. He didn't move at all. I'm like, okay. I no, I got a big good dude. I got just cause that I dog with a big pit bull. Yeah, oh. And I told him when he Huge. walked in, I said, I promise you, he won't leave that mat. Mm. And yeah, I told him to the corner. Heard a little <laughs> that and was I, it, but he didn't move at all. I was gonna call you today and ask yeah. you about that. What you thought of man? I was talking about anxiety. <laughs> Woo! Uh, okay. All right, you ready? All right, one, two, three. Talk your shit. Uh, for me, uh, 
pay attention to the details in the conversations that you have with people. Mm. Because a lot of times you'll miss the small things when they ask for the help and you don't even know they ask for the help. Yeah, mm. That's big. I that's needed that. Deep. That's, that's, that's deep. I think I was trying to say, I didn't know I said right. I needed that. I mean, especially nowadays. I mean, think about what with just COVID being trapped you know, in the house by yourself, a lot of people don't have a release. You know, my release was sports. You know, luckily we had a kickball season this year yeah. because, right. of, yeah. because it being a summer Yeah, shout out to Diddy for that. You yeah, know, definitely. but leading up to kickball, we had nothing. You know, they shut down the gym. They shut down the, you know, the the basketball course. They shut down everything. And for me, that was big because I at least knew that I could go to Highland Elementary School uh, every Tuesday and, ha- and play basketball with my boys and have that physical yeah. release, yeah. you know, to sit there with everybody and just drop a shoulder into somebody and drive to the lane. You know, if it, it gives you, it's, it's better than beating up somebody on the street because yeah. you're stressing out, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't, I don't try to take my stress different places. If I got stress at home, I'm going to leave that shit at home. Mm-hmm. If I got stress at work, I'm going to leave it at work mm-hmm. because if I'm intermixing it, it just creates toxic, but pay attention to people. If you get a random call, phone call from somebody, yeah, they might be calling you because they need some money. Yeah. But what's the story behind them needing the money? You mm-hmm. know, dig deeper to figure out what the issue is because it could be an issue where it's a deeper issue than just, oh, I need to just go get this money because I need to get some milk for the kid. But why don't you have money for the milk for the kid? Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Really pay attention to your friends because oh. there's a lot of people out here struggling. Mm-hmm. You know, and they struggle with mental health. And like we said, it's not normalized. And now that it's becoming it, where where are these outlets to go to? Mm. You know, who do you talk to? Because Drew didn't been through what I through, so I, but what I've been through. So if I come to him and try to explain it to him, he'll never get it because he's never been through it. But to listen, now he understands it a little bit more. So the next person comes to him, he can relate mm-hmm. because he says, I got a friend that can relate to. Mm-hmm. You know, in my story can help him with his story and the people that he needs to connect to. So Yeah, that's, that's dope. That's so good, then man. we um are going to let's give a round, look give a round of applause to our guest. <laughs> thank you. Uh first of all, just thank you first and foremost for your vulnerability because it, we know it's not easy for people to divulge, you know, like kind of like the the depths of their lives. So thank you so much for um, coming by, sharing your story. And thank you to all of the black therapists that I reached out to. They gave me some of the strategies. They will be linked in the description of this episode. But remember, we do this every single week. Um, next week, we can look, you can look forward to us interviewing the big man behind the mic tone. But this week, uh, we definitely thank you and appreciate you for tuning in, for sticking with us, for hearing this gentleman's story. And always speak your truth and talk your shit. Peace. All right, y'all. Appreciate y'all tuning in, Jay. What's up?